Well, first, welcome everybody who's watching um, now or later. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, my first Facebook live stream. And uh, it is my first attempt at giving a formal uh, lecture discussion on music history and music appreciation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joseph Jones, and I am a uh, composer and a conductor. Primarily, I also play percussion and viola, and I've been a musician pretty much my entire life. Um, I'm currently the, the founder and artistic director, um, principal conductor of Orchestra Amadeus, which is a New York City-based project with a mission of promoting social justice through classical music. Um, Orchestra Amadeus has been around for about five years officially, although it goes back to 2010. Uh, and I started it because I, I wanted to be able to respond to natural disasters and other issues, but also be proactive in bringing classical music to people, bringing people together through classical music and address longer term issues in, in society, like human trafficking awareness, gun violence prevention, mental health awareness, so on and so forth. Um, and that largely ties into what I want to accomplish in this lecture and, and other um, future talks. And that is setting a, establishing a sense of context for classical music, which is so often misunderstood or maligned or just outright ignored um, in today's society, particularly here in the United States, where it is so often seen as academic or elitist or um, or classist. And I think that when people start getting to know the stories behind the music and to know why it was written and, and, and what it all means and who the composers were, uh, the human side of it comes into even sharper focus. So that's our goal here today. So let's start with a definition. What is classical music? And that's not merely empty rhetoric. Putting a, a, a definition to it um, is something that a lot of us struggle with um, because it's, it's tough to give a good answer. For one reason, it's a huge, um, complex genre of music spanning about 500 years of history, dozens of countries, thousands of composers, um, and many different forms. So bringing that all under one umbrella uh, isn't easy. Well, the term classical music is sort of a misnomer. Um, it's really a marketing term and a 20th century marketing term. I mean, before that, it was just sort of called music. Um, maybe a, a, a clearer term would be Western art music because it is so closely associated with European culture and history. Um, and certainly the classical music we know and love today originated in Europe. But I mean, this is music that appeals to and, and has been played by and composed by um, people from all over the world, all different cultures, all different backgrounds. Uh, so Western art music is also a bit of a misnomer. Uh, I want, want to go back to some of these these myths that I, I want to dispel. You know, a lot of times when I tell somebody that I've just met that I'm a classical musician, they say, well, that's great, but I, I don't know much about classical music. And I want to say, oh, we are doing such a, a bad job in our field of, of exposing people to it because right away, the, the idea that you have to have a strong intellectual background and experience with this music in order to appreciate it or even enjoy it, really doesn't do the music any favors, let alone us in the profession. So it is seen as elitist, probably because it's a very expensive art form. Um, a symphony orchestra, which is what most people, I would I would say are likely to be exposed to or, or think of when they, they hear classical music. Symphony orchestra has 50, 60, 80, 100 members. And getting all of those musicians together and on stage and into a concert hall is a very expensive proposition. So orchestras are run as nonprofit organizations, and thus we rely on donors and sponsors to exist. Donors and sponsors are wealthy people. Um, 
So yes, there is, it, it can come across as elitist and although it's expensive to produce, um, the people who wrote it and have played it traditionally have not been uh, the elites, um, at least not socially and financially. Um, it's often seen as, seen as out of touch. Um, I can assure you, and we will get to this, I mean, this is sort of the, the crux of this entire discussion. Um, it is not out of touch. It, it, is, it is music which was written from a, a place of experience and love and humanity and uh, it has a wide range of emotions. Um, it seems like a lot of people who don't have particular amount of experience with classical music think of it as um, sad or uh, very often calming. I, I hear this comment a lot. Oh, yes, I love classical music. I listen to it when I'm trying to sleep or study. And I want to say, no, that, that's that not what we're going for. I mean, yes, there is a lot of classical music, which is beautiful and, and can be calming and peaceful. But it is so much more than that. There is music that is violent and and disturbed and disturbing and and provocative and sensual and and sexual and raw and visceral and everything in between. Uh, there are composers who put into music their experiences with death, um, the death of, of of a child, a loved one, um, a, a colleague, their own fear of death. Um, there are depictions in music of of battles and, and murders and and bacchanals and a lot of other things so we again have to do so much better as musicians uh, about getting the context out to people um so yes classic music anything but boring anything but just calming uh, one thing that Europeans do extremely well, that European culture and European history has always done extremely well, is categorizing things, whether it's measurement, whether it's naming things. Um, I mean, it's done well to a fault in some cases. But for our purposes here today, I think categorization can go a long way towards helping people understand and appreciate and, and think about music. And and one disclaimer that I, I should have started off with. Now this, you know, I am a professional musician um, and I have a certain fluency in not just musical language, but how, how I talk about music. And the way that I, I speak about music to my friends and colleagues who are also musicians, it, it's sort of like geek speak. Um, we have this whole insider language. Um, and it can be a little odd to people who are not um, fellow musicians. So I don't know exactly who is going to watch these, um, these, these lectures, these videos, but I'm assuming it's not going to be exclusively professional musicians, and I hope not. And I realize I can't be all things to all people, but I'm going to do my best to be, to make this accessible to everybody. And I would like to gear it towards people um, who may not know much about classical music, but are curious. And this can serve as a starting point to exploring music, whether that means going to your local symphony, which yes, please do, no matter where you are in the world, go see a concert. Could be one of the great orchestras of the world, could be your local conservatory or uh, amateur orchestra or a chamber music series. Go and support and listen to live music, but also go on YouTube, look at videos. If you can't get out to a concert hall, especially these days, um, buy recordings, just listen any way you can immerse yourself in music. So I want to be useful and informative to somebody who has no experience to people who have some experience, but are not professional musicians. Um, I hope that I can help you build on the experience and knowledge you do have and find maybe new vocabulary um, and new things to explore. And of course, for my, my friends and colleagues who are professional musicians, um, there might be 
quite a few things that are redundant, um, but hopefully I, I will at least say something amusing from time to time and maybe share a bit of trivia or a point of view that um, you find interesting. So um, back to categories. Uh, one of the easiest ways to approach classical music, even for somebody who's, who makes a life and a career in it, is to, to think of composers and repertoire, music that we play by category. So there are traditionally uh, a, a handful of categories by era. There's the Baroque era, which is roughly from 1600 to 1750, the classical era from 1750 to say about 1827, the romantic era from which fetches roughly from 1820 to 1916. Yes, some overlap, we will get to that. And the modern era or 20th century, modern, pre-war, interwar, post-war, modern, post-modern, we'll get to that too. Um, so that's categorization by era. Next is function. Not all classical music is created equal. Um, another misnomer or myth about classical music is, is that, you know, because it incorporates the word classic that we think of classical, music's at, classical music as the classics. So we think of Pachelbel's Canon, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, um, Ravel's Bolero. I mean, yes, these are classics, um, but not all classical music is, well, a, a great classic. Um, there's a lot of really bad music. There's a lot of mediocre music, and there's a lot of music that is wonderful and written by geniuses, but it's just, it's just fun. Like Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Um, not everything is deeply poignant or profound or tragic or, you know, uh, Mozart wrote a song called Lick My Butt, which is an extreme example. And for the younger crowd out there, I hear you laughing. Um, but, you know, Mozart was one of the great geniuses, great minds in Western history. And he also had a really great body sense of humor and he incorporated that into his music. So while we might think of the great operas um, that he composed, which delve into the, the, the deepest recesses of the human psyche and show the greatness and the resilience of the human spirit, he also wrote pieces that were little jokes among, uh, to share with his friends and, and to amuse himself and, and whoever else was around. So um, there's a, you know, a range of classical music from that which was designed just to sort of entertain people who were around to the most deeply profound music, which is meant to reflect the most serious elements of the human experience. And then we have form. Um, there are pieces of classical music that require hundreds of performers to be on, on stage at the same time. Mahler's Eighth Symphony, great case in point. Um, double chorus, eight vocal soloists, sing, uh, children's chorus, gigantic orchestra, um, wonderful piece. And then there are pieces for one performer, solo piano, unaccompanied violin or cello pieces. Um, there are these small unaccompanied works that are deeply profound and there are pieces for huge orchestra that are just kind of fun. So again, we can categorize these in, in many different ways, but our expectations of classical music are not always going to be the same as the experience. So let's delve into who the players are in classical music. Well, we start with musicians. Those are the people who play the music. Um, throughout music history, there have been basically two salient um, classes of musicians. We've had the virtuosi, the people who are really, really, really good at their instruments and, and they're soloists with orchestras or they give solo recitals that people line up for and we're just captivated by their genius, by their ability to play their instrument at an extremely high level, but also to, to connect with us as a group, as an audience, but also as an individual. And 
I mean, we have so many examples throughout history. We think back to the 19th century, starting with Paganini, uh, who legend had it sold his soul to the devil while he was in prison. And he said, if, you know, I'll give you my soul if I can become the greatest violinist ever. And, you know, he was, he was tall, he was thin. He, uh, he always had this, this sort of nervous energy about him. He had long hair. I mean, he was a, a, a 19th century rock star and sex symbol. And he did things on the instrument that nobody had ever done before. And people went to listen to him, but also to watch him because he, he was, we have these accounts of, of how frenzied he was that he would go into this trance when he played. Um, Franz Liszt was similar. I mean, he would just captivate audiences. Um, and uh, Yasha Heifetz in the 20th century, great violin virtuoso, who was just always perfect, never played a wrong note, never, I mean, he was just, there was nobody like him at anything ever um, before or since. So we're captivated by virtuosi. Um, the other cult is that of genius. And that's genius with a capital G, which again, we'll get to in greater depth later. But, but this is the idea of the tortured soul. Um, Mozart, who was the great miracle of music. Uh, Beethoven, who had this incredibly hard life and and went deaf and um, just was scorned by society and turned away from society and yet wrote these wrote this music of great humanity and power and hopefulness and uh, I mean it, it's a great narrative and he's one of the great figures in music and probably you know human history of the last five hundred years uh, for whom most of the myths are actually true or at least pretty close to true. Um, so we have these, these two archetypes, the virtuoso who is this public extroverted figure and the genius who is this, this the bastion of, of introverted strength and fascination. But most of us aren't the great virtuoso, the, the epoch making virtuoso um, or the once in a generation genius. We sort of matter too. I mean, without the rest of us, it, there wouldn't be all that much music. So let's let's call ourselves for the moment rank and file musicians. Uh, doesn't mean that we don't necessarily possess some genius or or that, that we can't keep up with them. Um, but you know, we don't get paid the big bucks necessarily. We aren't. Uh, we don't go down in history along with Mozart and Beethoven, and that's mostly okay. Traditionally, musicians have been servants. Now, I, I would humbly say that even today, every good musician, every great musician is a servant of the music because we have to devote ourselves to the mastery of an instrument and to serving the composer and his or her intentions. Um, musicians as servants historically has been a little bit more literal, uh, especially up through about 1800 or so when uh, musicians tended to, to come under the employ of aristocratic patrons at court or for occasions, and they were treated like the rest of the help. They ate with the help. They wore the uniforms of the help. Um, they were servants. And even those who were geniuses, Mozart's another, uh, uh, this is another great example for Mozart. I mean, everyone knew how brilliant he was, how great he was, but he was still expected to know his place and be a servant, which didn't sit too well with him. And, and there are a lot of wonderful stories um, about Mozart's resistance of authority and attitude toward authority. Uh, but he was part of the servant class. Um, again, we'll, we'll get to how that changed a little bit later but that's the rank and file musician. Now, most of us, when we think of music, might think of composers first. Well, classical music, Beethoven, Mozart, Mahler, Berlioz, Bartok, I mean, just, okay, the music we're going to listen to is written by somebody. Um, and historically, there have been sort of three categories of composers. Up through really the end of Beethoven's life, he died in 1827, most composers were also performers. Um, they would get together and play music with their friends and with their colleagues. They were hired 
on sort of an itinerant basis, um, unless they had a position at court with the aristocracy. And they were expected to uh, to play their own compositions or to lead performances of their own compositions. So the idea of somebody being strictly a, a professional composer where that's all they did and didn't play anything was just unfathomable. Um, then we had in the Romantic era after the death of Beethoven, really starting around 1836 with Mendelssohn and the Gewandhaus in Leipzig, Germany, um, composers as conductors. So not all composers conducted and certainly not all conductors composed, but the composer as conductor, the creator and person who realized the music and led the music and shaped the music and musical culture, performance practice, came into vogue and had a huge influence on music history since. So that started with Mendelssohn uh, around 1836, as I mentioned, and very quickly he developed a, a rivalry with Richard Wagner, the great opera composer. They established sort of the first philosophical school of modern conducting. Um, Mendelssohn's ideas on conducting were that the, the musical text, what's on the page is sacred and the conductor's job is simply to realize that and bring it to life. Wagner, who had a slightly larger ego than Mendelssohn, was of the opinion that the score, although yes, it was sacred to a certain degree, was also just a starting point for the conductor and the performers. And that the conductor was duty bound as much as Mendelssohn believed that the, the conductor was duty bound to adhere to the score faithfully, Wagner believed the conductor to be duty bound to impose his own will on it. And so it became common practice for the conductor to touch up the score, modernize it in some places to, to make his own um, amendments to matters of tempo and performance practice, style, ideas. And there was a lot of crossover. Um, conductors who were, I'm sorry, composers who were also serious conductors would allow their conducting habits in many cases to influence how they wrote. Um, this of course reached its pinnacle with Mahler, who was act most active between 1890, let's say 1890, um, and his death in 1911. And he became sort of the, the archetype and prototype for a great deal of 20th century and modern conducting. Uh, but we'll move on from, from that for now. So that's composer as conductor. Um, then in the 20th century, we got composers as specialists. Now the 20th century, of course, became an age of specialization in pretty much every discipline in the world. And while a lot of late romantic and 20th century composers did play something, they weren't necessarily building careers as performers. Um, their virtuosity or, or competence on an instrument was sort of incidental, but when they became known as composers, that's what they did. And they supported themselves um, through either commissions or patronage or more usually having some sort of academic appointment um, which afforded them the stability to be able to compose and build on that. And um, that's what they did and what they were known for. Now, I've used this term a few times, patronage. Music, as I mentioned, is expensive. And the money for putting on concerts, for training musicians, for living as a musician, um, is very expensive. So patronage has evolved over the years. Uh, in the Renaissance and Baroque era, the main patron for music was the church, here meaning largely the Catholic church. Um, although the, the Lutherans did okay. I mean, they, they did give us Bach, so can't give all the credit to Rome. Um, but the, the church dominated musical life and development for about 150 years. And they had very strict rules on counterpoint and harmony and even rhythms. And to have a stable job as a musician usually meant that you were Kapellmeister, 
or music director um, at a church. And that meant turning out liturgical music, such as you know, masses and, and occasional pieces, um, often being attached to the church's school, if there was one, and so teaching young musicians. Um, and then you could, uh, if you had time, you could do whatever you wanted as, as long as the church did disapprove on the side. But in exchange, you would get room and board uh, or a good salary and some prestige and, uh, and some stability. Uh, the next phase of patronage was the court orchestra. Private aristocrat, uh, <laughs> aristocrats, yes. Um, and this stretched from roughly Haydn's maturity, so let's say 1750 to uh, around the turn of the century, around um, the the beginning of Beethoven's second period, around 1800. And courts would spring up. Um, Sometimes it was also the church, if, if they were a major seat like the, the uh, like an archbishop, um, they would have essentially a court orchestra. But very often these were um, dukes and counts and princes, maybe not crown princes, um, and so on and so forth. And at their court, they would employ uh, an orchestra. The most famous example of this would probably be Franz Joseph Haydn. Uh, born in 1732, died in 1809, and he spent the bulk of his career at Esterhazy. Now, Esterhazy was a bit off the beaten path. Um, it was not in a major cultural center. I mean, this would have been like being, I don't know, somewhere on Long Island for a New Yorker. You were sort of close to the action. You know, there were sort of New York connections, but you were way out in the middle of nowhere. And Haydn had a really good gig. He was... Um, at first, Vice Kapellmeister, and then succeeded um, the the Kapellmeister when he retired, um, and he had a lot of duties. He had to compose music, of course. He had to confer with his with his patron, Prince Esterhazy, um, to see what he wanted. Um, he had to hire and fire musicians and and rehearse with them and set a good moral example for them to make sure that they didn't get out of line. Uh, and, um, of course, lead performances of opera and symphony and um, anything else the prince wanted. Uh, Haydn was very lucky in that the prince really genuinely liked music, and the prince really genuinely liked Haydn. And they did have a formal relationship. It was very much the prince and the servant, but there was mutual respect and Haydn was able to focus on invention and he was paid very well. He was respected. Um, he was able to, um, to be recognized beyond the borders of, of, of Esterhazy. Uh, and he lived a great deal of his adult life there and his fame, his fame spread throughout Europe. And uh, he's probably the greatest example of, a true genius who had a steady job. Um, he had a very comfortable life. His one great tragedy seems to have been that he married a woman who made him a philosopher rather than happy. I think it was Goethe who said that. Um, but other than that, he, he had a pretty good life. Uh, Mozart had wealthy patrons, but wasn't so great uh, at the whole mutual respect thing. Uh, so his, his patrons were not steady. And the last sort of great patronage came, from, came with, um, with Beethoven. But I mean, Beethoven's special case, again, we'll get to this a little bit later as well. Beethoven is, Beethoven straddles and bridges and also defines two separate eras. And fascinating life. Um, this is the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. So it's a big Beethoven year. There's a lot to talk about with him. Uh, but it's, it's interesting how he straddled these two eras. So that, that takes me to the, the next era of patronage. Post-Napoleonic War, um, more middle class 
patronage. So the first 20, 25 years of the 19th century saw a continuation of the aristocratic patronage that Mozart and Haydn had experienced. But the royals were a lot more liberal after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. So while they still wouldn't see somebody like Beethoven as an equal, they were much more likely to say, hey, come and have dinner with me and don't sit at the servant's table. Uh, now, Beethoven sometimes pushed this too far, as did some of his patrons. Um, one of his, his, his most famous patrons, Prince Lichnowsky, I believe it was, um, liked to joke around. And one evening, he, he joked around a little, little too harshly and suggested to Beethoven that, you know, Beethoven better remember his place. And Beethoven didn't take too kindly to that. He didn't exactly realize that the prince was joking. And he stormed off. And before he left the room, he said, remember, there are thousands of princes, but only one Beethoven. The relationship wasn't quite the same after that, but Beethoven also wasn't marched off uh, in exile or to the dungeons. So, you know, they were a little bit more liberal and interested in seeing their, uh, those to whom they extended their patronage thrive and gain more prosperity. That was succeeded by the so-called music vereins. Um, the Friends of Music Society. And this is uh, this would lead to the, uh, the sort of spiritual uh, idea of, of civic responsibility that established many of the great American orchestras in the 20th century or, or later in the 19th century. So Friends of Music Societies were people who were middle class, not aristocratic, but well-to-do, who loved music and wanted to support music. And the music for Dines, um, led to the creation of the Vienna Philharmonic, which is one of the world's greatest orchestras and has been around since 1842. Um, and also smaller societies, um, things that, that we would today think of as, um, you know, the, the local chorus, uh, choral society or local um, community or semi-professional orchestra. Uh, that was followed by wealthy private patrons um, in the post-industrial years, the most salient and, and famous and possibly intriguing example of this was Peter uh, Tchaikovsky, the great Russian romantic composer's patroness, Najahida von Meck. They had about a 20 year um, platonic courtship <laughs> and von Meck wanted Tchaikovsky to be able to just compose. Um, she was widowed, she was the the um, uh, the beneficiary of a railroad fortune, and she and Tchaikovsky carried on a torrid, again platonic, but but torrid uh, love affair through letters. And she sent him money and supported him and uh, commissioned things from him. And her only stipulation was that they never meet in person. And uh, eventually, her kid said, "Mom." Uh, you know, this Tchaikovsky, nice music and all, but it, this is getting a little weird. And um, maybe this money is better spent elsewhere. So she somewhat reluctantly withdrew her patronage and Tchaikovsky, well, we'll, we'll get to him later. But uh, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic story and um, quite literary in its way. Finally, we come to modern institutional patronage. And this is really where money and support has moved away from individual artists to the institutions that employ them. Uh, so these are the, the modern socialites and, uh, and, um, and other wealthy people who support our modern symphony orchestras, opera companies, uh, chamber music societies, and they will endow chairs, for example, and give, um, uh, six and seven figure donations to these organizations who turn around and hire musicians and create um, in some cases, very well paid, um, stable jobs. So that is patronage. All right, let's go back to this idea of categorization. 
and work through the various eras. So modern classical music, as we think of it, skipping the Baroque, which my father would berate me for, but you know, he was a singer, I'm an orchestral guy, so I'm going to, to go with my bias on this one for now. Um, so let's say modern classical music begins with the Baroque era. Again, roughly 1600 to 1750. So 1600, we're coming out of the Renaissance, we're establishing um, a new era, the the age of enlightenment and the age of reason are within shouting distance. And the pieces that will make up our modern musical chessboard are being put into place. So the Baroque style is characterized by a lot of improvisation um, and a very ornate, fluid, um, figurative style. Basically, we're talking very fancy music. And we're moving away from the purely vocal music of the Renaissance, largely vocal music of the Renaissance and um, almost exclusively liturgical music of that era to music which now has room for secular um, uses. Although there is still a lot of sacred music being performed. Um, and we see the rise of dance suites and the oratorio and other forms, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, at this point, we have pretty non-standard instrumentation. The violin is uh, growing out of the, the lute family and it's a newfangled instrument, but it, uh, it becomes really popular really quickly. And there are some really great craftsmen making them. Some guy named uh, Stradivari is going to make some, uh, his teacher uh, Amati, the Guarneri family is going to have a dynasty. And so there are a lot of virtuosic violinists who are applying their trade and writing music for the violin, because remember, this is the era of composer performers. And we're starting to see ensembles form. Now, we think of the modern orchestra, we think of, you know, full complement of winds, brass, percussion, strings. In the Baroque, not so much. It, it's non-standardized, it's decentralized, and pretty much if there's an orchestra, it depends on who is on hand, who's nearby. So uh, for one thing, we don't have clarinets in the Baroque era, which is awful. I mean, complete travesty. Um, French horns are just coming in from the wild. So we're going to hear a lot of, a lot different horn playing than what you hear in, you know, 150 years time. Uh, they're playing natural horns, which were very limited in the notes they could play. So they, they have a crook system where you could, you could remove part of the instrument physically and put another different crook in and play more notes or play notes in a different key, different tonality. Um, you have trumpets, you have timpani, but they're generally only called for in occasional music, in really celebratory um, big operas or something regal, something to be played at court, so special occasions. And the violin family, as I mentioned, violins are becoming really popular, but what we think of today, the, the some changes that'll be made around 1800 have not been made yet, so the technique of the instrument and the way music is written for it is slightly different from how we think of it today. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of forms, um, there are a handful of forms that are emerging, which are different from the Renaissance. We have liturgical forms, um, masses and, uh, and motets and oratorios on biblical themes and occasional music for feast days. We have secular music in the form of dance suites. Uh, we have the concerto for a solo performer with an orchestra accompanying as the, the virtuoso becomes a little bit uh, more independent. And the concerto grosso, which is a group of soloists playing with an ensemble. And we have opera. Now, one disclaimer. Uh, because I don't think I can make this into a three hour lecture, there are going to be a lot of things that I'm going to admit to omit. So if I don't talk about opera a lot, and if I don't talk about certain composers who are absolutely worthy of being talked about, um, 
it's not a value judgment, it's just for the sake of time and illustration. Um, but modern opera begins around 1600 with the Camerata in Italy and becomes one of the most popular forms of music. Um, and the opera is one of the few places in, in society where the wealthy and, uh, and, and the royal would come together with commoners and in, enjoy time together, or at least enjoy time uh, in the same place. We also have highly regional styles. Um, the way music is written, the way it sounds, really depends on where you live. There's not a whole lot of cosmopolitanism largely because people aren't traveling that much. And the cosmopolitanism that we do have is usually academic or a curiosity. Uh, so we think of representative composers of the Baroque era. Um, at the top, we have to place Bach and Handel, um, two Germans, although Handel spent a great deal of his time in England. Um, Handel pioneered or at least perfected the oratorio, which was a satisfying compromise between choral music, pure choral music, and opera. Oratorio could be highly dramatic. It was highly entertaining. Um, it demanded a great deal of virtuosity from its solo singers and from the chorus, but could be enjoyed by anybody and everybody. Bach mastered counterpoint and uh, Aside from writing over a thousand works in his lifetime, he also had 20 children. So he was a pretty busy guy. And toward the end of his life, some of his children, who are also composers and very fine composers, thought that he was a little bit too old fashioned. Um, I'm going to disagree with the junior Bachs and say he wasn't old fashioned so much as a man with incredibly encyclopedic knowledge and command of, of all things music up to that point. And to anyone out there, musician or non-musician, I say, if you want to know what's possible in music, everything you ever need to know is in Bach. Um, it's amazing how much there is and how, and that so much, so much of his music is perfect. And many of his pieces were actually written with education in mind. So to, to come away from them saying, well, there's a lot to learn here um, is absolutely appropriate. Uh, one of the things that makes him so distinctive is that he married this high intellectualism with profound, deep, sincere spirituality. And that comes across so strongly in, in all of his music, not just the liturgical music, of which he wrote a lot, the, the Mass in B minor, the St. Matthew Passion. I mean, if you want to hear great, devoted, spiritual, religious music, listen to those works and you will never need to listen to anything else ever again. I mean, they, everything is there. Okay, you can listen to some other things, but really everything is there. <laughs> but um, in, his, in his other music, his, his smaller pieces, the, 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 the trifles, like the, the inventions and symphonias, which were teaching pieces, um, for, for students, both to gain dexterity um, and competence on the keyboard, but also in counterpoint. Um, yes, they're teaching pieces, but there is so much music in them. And Bach did that so well. So there, there are the, uh, in my mind, the, the greatest representatives of the Baroque, or at least the most uh, quintessential, if unique which is another sort of hallmark of genius that there were so many of these, these great geniuses in, in music history who were both quintessential and unique at the same time. Um, anyway, uh, going back to representative composers, we also have a very strong musical center in Italy. Think of Vivaldi with his hundreds of concertos, um, Padarelli. Um, in England, we have Henry Purcell, who was probably the last great English composer until we get to the, the last part of the 19th century. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. But again, not a lot of cosmopolitanism, but great, brilliant regional 
um, attitudes and and production in music. So we get to the end of the Baroque era, and now we are into the classical era. And the classical era contrasts sharply uh, in terms of simplicity, clarity. Uh, I would say that that when we think of classical music, music of the classical era, we are talking about music with simple textures, but it's very elegant. We're focused on melody and accompaniment. So not so much counterpoint anymore. Um, although we'll, we'll return to it later. And it's interesting to note that a great deal of liturgical music does retain elements of the, the Baroque style, particularly in, in Mozart's liturgical music, which owes a huge amount to Handel and, and Bach, um, whom he admired greatly. And the same with Beethoven, but again, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So we think of the ideals, what was going on in the world in the classical era? Well, it was a busy time. Uh, we think of it as 1750 to, let's say, you know, the 1820s. Um, so we had um, this little skirmish called the American Revolution. And then the French Revolution, we had great intellectuals like Voltaire. We were moving firmly into the Age of Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, where we were going from this, this idea of Machiavelli's divine right of kings to saying, and, and the, these ideas that everything that happens in the affairs of men is preordained by God, moving out of Calvinism to this highly scientific well, age of reason, where people are starting to say, wait a second, okay, I can maybe accept that somebody upstairs wants the king to be the king. We can, we can work with that. But maybe things happen because maybe there's another way, aside from religion, aside from spirituality, to address why things happen the way they do. So ordered thinking, um, highly structured, highly logical thinking, comes into play. We get um, dissenting voices like Voltaire, who suddenly start poking fun at the establishment and saying, you know, maybe we should stop and think about this. We get uh, Rousseau and the social contract and Hume and just all of these, these great writers. And, 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 and later, of course, um, Schiller with his idea of universal brotherhood and Goethe with the idea of the romantic tragic artist um, at the, and at the tail end of the era, E.T.A. Hoffman with increasing imagination and great lyrical romantic poets. Uh, so this is a very different time. And uh, it's a time of questions and searching and um, by the end of, of the era of, of violence and reform and social upheaval. And we hear that in the music. Uh, one of the big questions about classical music, again, going back to the term classical music, um, comes to, to say, what is, what is classical? And in antiquity, classicism, particularly when it came to education, meant the trivium. The trivium was this trio of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And in education, the idea is that if in roughly the years from modern day kindergarten through eighth grade, if a, a child is taught those three things, taught to master grammar, logic, and rhetoric, then they can become masterful students of any subject they want. And I've applied that to classical music, music both you know, classical music in general and music of the classical era in particular. And it is, it is structured so strongly around these three things. Now, keeping with that, one of the um, defining moments in music history, and it wasn't one moment, it wasn't an aha moment like the Tristan chord, I'll get to that later. But one of the, the defining ideas, I, I guess I should say, is the rise of sonata form. 
Sonata form was applied to multiple uh, multiple forms. Um, we find sonata form in string quartet, in the symphony, in overtures, in the concerto, um, even within opera, within operatic movements. And sonata form is actually really simple. It's typically a four movement form. Let's take the symphony as an example. First movement, um, there will be an introduction and then an exposition in which two ideas are presented. Uh, there's the, the first principal idea and then a second contrasting idea. Uh, the contrast could be tonal, it could be in a, it, well, it's usually in a different key. Um, it could be in a slightly different tempo or at least in a, a slightly different character. Um, but there are these two ideas. That's repeated, the exposition is repeated. Then we move into the development. In the development, these two contrasting ideas are played with. They're pulled apart, they're examined, they're reconstructed, they're deconstructed, they're turned upside down, inside out, backwards, then finally put together for the recapitulation in which the exposition is repeated with a slight modification in tonality so that it can lead directly into the coda, which is a, a, a section of new music, which takes the spirit of, of the two themes, um, but ends the movement. Um, second movement is usually the slow movement um, and is often either a theme or theme and variations or some sort of aria, a song-like movement. Uh, the third movement is a dance. In the classical, it's almost always a minuet um, up until Beethoven. Then it switches to a scherzo. Uh, scherzo is a musical joke. And later we'll um, also include the Landler, a, a, an Austrian folk dance. But third movement is a dance movement. And the fourth movement is Sonata Allegro form, which is a modified, usually abridged version of the Sonata form from the, the first movement. So there you have it. And, it, and they're usually uh, first movement fast, second movement slow, moderately slow, third movement lively, fourth movement very fast. Okay, so we have Sonata form. Uh, and the way that the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric is applied to sonata forms is absolutely brilliant. I mean, it, it, it works so well. And we can think of grammar, we can, we can apply the concept of grammar to rhythmic development and tonal development, logic, phrase structure, and rhetoric, the actual musical ideas. The musical ideas don't necessarily mean something I mean, they have meaning, but they, they're not programmatic. You're not, it's, it's not, it's abstract, um, but not in a way that it can actually address and solve a problem. The way it's treated addresses and solves a problem, but the ideas themselves are rhetorical. So classicism fits wonderfully by way of the trivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric. Now we'll return to the idea of cosmopolitanism. Uh, it's becoming more fashionable. And we'll return to Mozart as an example. Uh, Mozart born in, in Austria or Germany, depending on which historian you, you prefer to, uh, um, to agree with. But um, he's a Germanic composer, but he travels extensively. His, his father takes, he and his sister Nenerol, um, who is also a prodigy, brilliant, one of the many um, unsung heroines of music history um, on this tour across Europe. And they, they go to different parts of, of the German-speaking world. They go to Paris. Um, he thinks about going to London at one point. He, um, he goes to Italy. And everywhere he goes, he's picking up um, the language and the musical lingua franca, which is the, the, the Carmen, the, the, the common musical language, the, the, the sophisticated colloquialisms. And this all makes its way into his music. And sometimes it makes its way into his music through just ideas. So when we get to, um, oh, his late teens, early twenties, when he spent some time in Italy, we start hearing Italian idioms in his symphonies. So we think of uh, Symphony Number no. Twenty Nine in A Major, which is as sunny and Italian as it gets. I mean, it's just, it's it's wonderful. Um, 
And we think of the abduction from the seraglio, which alludes to uh, Turkish music, Turkish idioms. Um, he, he throws in bass drum, cymbals, and triangle, which is sort of short, shorthand at that time for, hey, we're in Turkey now. And Turkey was, you know, it was the, the exotic place that's kind of close by and, and really different. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a crowd pleaser. And Mozart was also, as we've all seen in the movie Amadeus, those of us who have seen it, um, a little bit peeved with the, the fascination with foreign musicians coming in. It's, it's not necessarily chauvinistic or xenophobic, but it's a, this idea that if somebody's from another place, they must be, they must be seen as more authentic somehow or more interesting. And he grapples with this a little bit. And, uh, you know, it gives rise over the next few generations to these questions of, of nationalism or, or local musical language versus cosmopolitan or, you know, just foreign influences in general. And uh, it, it's very interesting to see how travels and, and um, relationships with musicians from other places, not just other composers, but um, other performers, makes its way in, into his music, or music of composers who lived and worked in a particular um, city or country. Uh, we still have, now we have orchestras at court and the, uh, the symphony, go back to that. The symphony today, of course, is a very public forum. You, you, you go to Lincoln Center, um, go to hear the New York Philharmonic and there's a very good chance that the big piece on the program is going to be a symphony. And there are a hundred musicians on stage and they, they play a, a symphony by Brahms or Tchaikovsky or Mahler or Dvorak or whomever is on the program that night. And it takes up 45, 50, 60, 70 minutes of the program. It's a very public extroverted form. But in the classical era, we're talking about a very private form. So we have small orchestras, sometimes as few as um, 17, 20, 25 musicians playing for the count, the prince, whoever's court it is. And some courts are really good and others, you know, they're, they're not so affluent, so they're not quite as impressive. Uh, but the symphony is a, and the orchestra is a, a private form. Um, orchestras as we think of them today, concerts as we think of them today, where you go to a public space like a concert hall or even a church and you pay money and go in and sit down and listen to an overture and a concerto and a symphony and, um, and then you go home. That didn't really exist then. Um, concerts were longer, they were more informal in a lot of ways, and they were at the pleasure of their patrons. Uh, at the same time, the orchestra itself is becoming more standardized. So we now have clarinets, yay, um, and horns are getting a little bit closer to the modern valved horns, although they're, they're still natural, they're still using crooks. Um, but by the by the end of the classical era, it is very standard to have two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two French horns, two trumpets, uh, a pair of timpani, and a small string orchestra. Small, small at the start, maybe six first violins, five second violins, four viola, two cello, and one bass. Um, by the end, uh, we're leaning more towards a minimum of six first, six second, four viola, four cello, two basses. And it keeps going, it keeps getting larger as, as time goes on. Um, one quick word about the clarinets. Clarinets were sort of exotic until the 1790s, maybe 1800. So there are a lot of Mozart's works which do not have clarinets. And when he does use them, it's such a treat. I mean, he wrote a uh, quintet and I believe a trio, and of course his great concerto for clarinet, and it is just marvelous. I mean, he does wonderful things with the instrument, and it's uh, it's really wonderful and uh, and joyous to see how he treats it and and how he um, shows appreciation for it when he does get to write for the instrument. Um, 
So that's the symphony, it's private form. The string quartet, which Haydn pioneered, two violins, viola, cello, and the sonata, um, a work for either solo piano or a solo instrument with piano accompanist or piano collaborator, um, also becomes a widespread private form. But whereas the symphony might be a little bit more extroverted in its expression, even in private, sonatas and the string quartet are often used as sort of personal diaries for their composers. Um, this is extremely true, um, especially true for Haydn and for Beethoven. Um, there is a very interesting thread of romanticism that runs through the classical era. And we like to think of it as reserved and pristine and um, much more restrained. But Haydn and Mozart were in many ways romantic composers. Haydn, for instance, uh, had a uh, storm and stress, Sturm und Trank period. And the symphonies he wrote um, in that time used unusual keys, minor keys, major keys that, that were a little more remote than usual. And they were more emotionally expressive and, and passionate than was typical. Uh, Mozart, uh, there's a huge strain of, of romanticism through all of Mozart's music. And that's where they have a whole other discussion that could last hours. But um, just one example in his 40th symphony written in 1789, uh, he uses a, a very, very modern device, a 12 tone row um, in the finale. And it just sort of comes out of nowhere and you go, I mean, there, there's, there's so much expressiveness, so much romanticism. And when you think about the poetry, the philosophy, the social attitudes um, and the goings on at court, the intrigues of the time, it's impossible not to listen for romanticism in these composers and in this music. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's, it's much more lyrical. It's, it's certainly more restrained than what we'll hear in Mahler a hundred years down the road, uh, a little over a hundred years down the road, but there's a lot of ro romanticism there and it's well worth exploring and thinking about and finding ways to express. Uh, liturgical music hasn't gone away, by the way. Um, Haydn and Mozart both wrote quite a number of masses, which are excellent. Mozart's last work, of course, the, the famous Requiem uh, or infamous Requiem, which was completed by one of his students after his death, was intended as a purely liturgical work. It was not dramatic. It was not a concert work. It was going to be performed at the, and was performed at the funeral of the mysterious commissioner, um, Count Walsag von Stubach, who had a habit of commissioning composers' works and then passing them off as his own. Mozart probably knew that it was Stubach who, who, um, who commissioned it. I mean, the, the idea of this mystery and, and Mozart being certain that he was going to die has been romanticized. And, you know, it's a great story, not entirely true, but um, I mean, it, it was a dramatic situation, but, you know, we have to remember that liturgical music in this time was written for practical use. So these masses would have been performed at church and the congregation would have listened to this music in real time. Um, and it's still perfectly suited for the concert hall, particularly Mozart's great mass in C minor, which was also left incomplete, um, although not for so tragic a reason as death. Um, but it is incredibly operatic and it's one of the great examples of Mozart's cheekiness and trying to get around the authorities and, and saying, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, I'm just going to find a way to slip it past you. And he did that pretty well. Uh, so we've talked about our representative composers for the classical era, Haydn and Mozart, of course, Beethoven and Schubert. And um, Beethoven and Schubert are unique cases in that they are composers of the classical era who are fully romantic in their expression. Um, Beethoven was both the inspiration for 
just about everything that happened in the Romantic era. I mean, everybody used Beethoven as a reference point, but he also intimidated the heck out of everybody. In fact, um, there were those who said, after Beethoven, who can write symphonies? And it's arguable that um, in the time between Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in 1824 and Brahms' first in the 1860s, sorry, 1870s, uh, there aren't a whole lot of really great indispensable symphonic works, with the exception maybe of Symphony Fantastique, but that that's a work that is such an outlier and so utterly, completely, wonderfully insane that it's a whole other category on its own. Um, so we start the Romantic era with Beethoven, who was the prototype of the artist as God, of the Romantic hero. He was born into maybe not the best situation. His father was incredibly abusive. He was somewhat of a prodigy. I mean, he showed tremendous uh, talent from a young age. And his father thought that he should be the next Mozart. And he would drag young Ludwig from bed in the wee hours of the morning and chain him to the piano and make him breakfast. Um, his father, aside from not being in the running for father of the year, most years or any years, um, also had a bit of a drinking problem, which got slightly out of hand to the point where, well, first young Ludwig would have to go down to the pub and drag his father home. And Ludwig was eight, nine, ten years old, and also begged the innkeeper to forgive his father his debts. And uh, eventually, you know, his, his father was not doing so well at work. His, his father played for the court orchestra, and it was decided that um, young Ludwig was very talented, would take over his father's duties. Well, this was great as, as far as, you know, the Beethoven family being able to eat, but it, it did not endear son to father, and his, his, his dad was pretty resentful of this. Well, eventually, young Ludwig left the relatively small city of, of Bonn, where he was born, for the metropolis of Vienna. And he was to study with Mozart, but unfortunately Mozart died. Um, so that didn't go so well. And Beethoven instead studied with Haydn, and um, Johann Georg Albrechtsberger, who is only remembered because he said of Beethoven, he has, he has been a horrible student and has learned nothing. And although Beethoven did learn a great deal from Haydn, he was not Haydn's favorite student either. But his talent was undeniable. And after a while, everybody started taking notice. Other musicians, potential patrons. And they said, well, this kid has a bit of an attitude, but he can play. He's a good pianist. And he is kind of fun at parties, pretty good dancer okay, well, pay attention to him a little bit more. Um, so Beethoven became celebrated, more or less. By this time, he was in his late 20s, early 30s. The Napoleonic Wars were raging. Uh, Beethoven had written his first two symphonies, um, the second, which really announced the, uh, the beginning of the Romantic Age in a lot of ways, and Beethoven's own middle period. And... He was working on his third symphony, which he was going to dedicate to Napoleon, the great man, the, the great leader, and a friend came in and said, Ludwig, Napoleon has declared himself emperor, and Ludwig had looked up to Napoleon. He was truly a, a hero, an idol to Beethoven. And Beethoven was so incensed that he, he, he cried out, him too? Now he too will be nothing but a tyrant. Now he too will trample on the rights of men. And he crossed out the dedication to Napoleon on the title page of the Third Symphony. And the second movement, which was a funeral march, was now dedicated to the memory of a great man. So Beethoven had a pretty rough start to life and now had seen his hero fall. Not a great first 30 years or so. Beethoven was also having some trouble hearing, and he kept going to doctors and trying to take care of it and hoped it would get better, but it didn't. And um, he finally 
tried one last effort um, in the small ta- suburb of um, Heidelstadt. And he realized that he was going to go deaf. And it was irreversible. He couldn't stop it. And uh, he took this time and this little retreat to write a letter to his brothers, who had noticed that Ludwig was not so much fun lately and had a little bit of an attitude problem, a little bit of a temper. And he wrote to his brothers saying, uh, guys, you've got to forgive me for this because there's a reason. It turns out I'm losing my hearing and I'm losing the one thing that was made and should be more perfect in me than any other man. And how can I say to anybody around me, speak louder for I am deaf, I can't hear you. Uh, he said, but for my art, I would have ended my own life. So if you see that I'm not uh, so social, if you see that I'm a little agitated, this is why, and, and please find it in your hearts to be understanding and forgiving. So now this, this great genius was doomed to a life of deafness, which is, as you can imagine, not so great for a musician. He had to withdraw from public public performances, and over the following years, he more or less withdrew from life and became more and more agitated. Um, he never married, and he did get the chance to sort of be a dad um, when one of his brothers died and left Ludwig in charge of his son, Carl, Beto, uh, Ludwig's nephew, Carl. But that didn't go so well. Uh, in fact, it went so badly that Carl eventually tried to kill himself and was unsuccessful, fortunately, but that sort of put a damper on their relationship. Um, so Beethoven had a lot to be upset about. He'd had uh, a rough go of it and had basically fully withdrawn from society by the time he was in his 40s. And yet somehow, instead of ceasing to compose, or instead of um, writing music which was ugly or hateful or devoid of spirit, he composed some of the most profound, powerful, beautiful, hopeful works, testaments to the power of the human spirit, to hope and resilience, and in the Ninth Symphony, Universal Brotherhood. And I mean, it's, it's an incredible story. And that was his legacy. I mean, his, his funeral was attended by 20,000 people. Uh, but life goes on, even when these great heroes die. And now there was a generation, what ended up being about two generations of composers, who said, well, I want to carry the torch, but now what? Uh, so we have the Romantic era. Um, and this era is going to be categorized, aside from you know the spirit of Beethoven, by a great expansion of, of rhythm and harmony, the expansion of the orchestra and orchestration, the rise of the conductor um, as a public figure and as a, a musical leader. And it's a century that's going to be marked by a struggle for liberty um, of, of, of great depth of emotion, of increasing individuality, of taking inspiration in, in music from nature and literature and philosophy and the visual arts. and all of this is making its way into music. Uh, and we have many more public forms now. We still have the symphony, of course, which is greatly expanded beyond what it was in Haydn and Mozart's day. Fully, fully public um, expressions of, of musicality and emotion and, and really uh, a town hall, a musical town hall for audiences. We have the tone poem or the symphonic poem, which is not quite a symphony, but um, a standalone uh, symphonic movement, which usually takes its inspiration from something extra musical, like, as I mentioned, nature, literature, philosophy, the visual arts. Um, <clears throat> there's a concert overture, which is now not just what you hear before an opera, but um, essentially a mini tone poem, but a standalone work. Uh, there are suites of dances, which are often cosmopolitan expressions for a particular composer. Um, and we have the concert waltz, which Johann Strauss Jr. is going to both popularize and perfect. 
And we have chamber music, string quartets, trios, um, quintets, um, string sextets, sonatas, which are much more public than they were in the classical era, and the concert mass and the oratorio enjoys something of a resurgence. Now, going back to categories, the Romantic, to my way of thinking, is not one long era. I break it up into four sub-eras. So we have the early Romantic period, uh, which overlaps Beethoven a little bit. Uh, these are composers who started writing in the 18-teens and wrote into the, let's say, 30s and 40s. This is um, very lyrical, classically proportioned music. Uh, think of Carabini and Spohr and von Weber. Um, then we have the mid-romantic, and this is building directly on the foundation of Beethoven. Still lyrical, still largely classically proportioned, at least in these first two composers, but we think of, of uh, Robert Schumann and Felix Mendelssohn, um, and not classically proportioned or restrained in any way, uh, but we have Hector Berlioz, who wrote some funny fantastic and was just utterly completely wonderfully insane um i mean he wrote an entire symphony the symphony fantastic about falling in love with and trying to marry a woman he'd never met and then when she rebuffs his advances in a dream he kills her and then is sentenced to death um yeah kind of crazy it was based on his unreturned affections for an actress, a, a real person. And they were unreturned because she never met him. He just admired her from afar. But eventually he approached her and said, hey, I wrote the symphony for you. Um, I kind of kill you in it, but it's only because I love you so much. And somehow that worked. So guys, if you need to pick up line, I guess, write a symphony. Um, amazingly, that marriage did not work out, but they tried. Uh, and then we have uh, pianist composers like Chopin, who wrote incredibly emotional, highly romantic works for the Salon, um, taking public emotion into very private spaces, which is an, an interesting turnaround. Then we get to the high romantic. Um, on one side, we have Liszt and Wagner, who pioneered the tone poem and the symphonic poem uh, Wagner, of course, took opera and said, this isn't opera anymore, this is music drama. And everything has to go with everything. So poetry, philosophy, music, high drama, uh, and my ego, all combined. And that's what the future of opera is going to be. And he kind of changed all of music history in 1865 with Tristan and Isolde. We'll get to that a little bit later as well. Um, so they were the, the champions of the music of the future, where everything had to be as over-the-top, emotional, um, and expressive as possible all the time. They were met head-on, although in a somewhat respectful, subdued manner, by Johannes Brahms and his circle. He was a torchbearer from, uh, who took over from Schumann, who declared him to be Beethoven's spiritual heir at the age of 20. So no pressure, Johannes. None at all. But Brahms wrote highly charged, emotionally profound works in a style with some classical restraint and certainly classical proportions. And Brahms loved devouring older music, um, understanding music all the way back to, to Bach and, and even Buxtehude and um, making encyclopedic use out of it in his modern era. Wonderful, wonderful composer, Brahms. Um, also, you know, mentored by the man who handed him the torch, Robert Schumann, kind of fell in love with Schumann's wife, uh, another unsung heroine or underappreciated heroine even today, music. Um, Robert died while Robert went crazy and then he died and Brahms and Clara sort of went Ross and Rachel and it was, well, they won't they, but they didn't. Um, they loved each other. And Clara was a, a devoted um, friend and champion of Brahms, but they didn't. Um, and then 
going a bit abroad from German speaking countries, you are Tchaikovsky, the master of the high romantic in Russia, and Dvorak, the bohemian cosmopolitan, who spent four years in the United States and tried to jumpstart American music, but that's also another story. Great story, but another story. Then we get to the late and post romantic era. This is the time of excess. Not the most subtle composers, these guys. You had Bruckner, who insisted that if you're going to write a symphony, it must be at least an hour long and be a cathedral of sound, I guess would be the, the best way to put it. He was also a bit of a strange guy. Uh, he had a, a habit of instantly proposing to any woman he met, and age appropriate was not in his vocabulary. So he liked, uh, you know, 18, 19 year old girls when he was 50, 60, not the best look. Um, he also was incredibly devoutly Catholic and very austere and yet somehow idolized Wagner who was neither. So there's that. And Mahler who, yeah, Mahler's interesting. Um, <laughs> Mahler said, hmm, hour-long symphonies, Bruckner, I see you that, and I raise you 10 to 20 minutes per symphony, and I'm going to double the orchestra size. And, oh, by the way, a symphony should be like the world. It must contain everything. And I'm also adding a, a, a dash of ennui and a little bit of, of, of childlike naivete and a gross obsession with death and everything. So that's smaller if you want some light listening. Um, <clears throat> and then there were uh, there was Saint-Saëns, who was sort of the musical Bogart, if you're into Harry Potter. Um, everyone can hear what Saint-Saëns' music sounds like, but nobody knows exactly what his music sounds like. It's wonderful. Um, he was also, well, maybe the greatest musical mind since Mozart, and he just sort of absorb music like a sponge, but he's not talked about the same way that Mozart is, which is interesting. He may have lived too long. He lived until, I believe, 1921, um, 1835 to 1921. Uh, so, yeah, he was around a while. Um, and then we have Zemlinsky, um, who was, you know, really unsung, wrote some, some wonderful operas, some wonderful tone poems, uh, almost married Mahler's eventual wife, Alma, became Schoenberg's brother-in-law and died just outside of New York City. So he was just always not quite in the right place at the right time. And then we could probably mark the end of the high post-romantic um, with the death of Max Rieger in 1916. Uh, so now we have fully cosmopolitan and national styles. Nationalism in, in music is huge in the 19th century as we start moving away from, um, well, well, as uh, I was going to say, as we move into the age of nation states, but that's really more 20th century, but we're moving away from um, confederate, confederacies of, of states to actual nations. So Germany becomes a nation, Italy becomes a nation, uh, in this time, and national pride is at an all-time high. And we have very national-sounding music, like, um, well, music by Joachim Raff, and Dvorak certainly has a, a nationalistic style. But a lot of other composers are highly cosmopolitan, either epochally cosmopolitan, in that they are drawing on earlier traditions in very self-aware ways, um, or they are borrowing influences from all over the world. Part of this, of course, is due to the fact that there's this huge body of music that's being performed. They're playing music from the classical and the Baroque eras along with what's being programmed, new music that's being programmed. So they're absorbing these earlier styles. But part of it also is that people are traveling more um, and cities are increasingly international. Uh, we have a gross expansion and standardization of the orchestra. Now, instead of um, a pair of woodwinds, sometimes we have three, the piccolo, the flat clarinet, the English horn, and the contrabassoon regularly make appearances. Horns are now usually four to an orchestra instead of two, 
trumpets always included, sometimes a third, cornets occasionally make an appearance, trombones are very often included, the tuba is included, uh, timpani are joined by other percussion instruments, and the string section is greatly enlarged. Uh, with regard to Strauss, we sometimes, for example, we, we sometimes have tone poems in which he requires a minimum of 16 first violins, 16 second, 14 viola, 12 celli, and 10 basses, or 16, 14, no, 16 first, 14 second, 12 viola, 10 celli, 8 bass, rather. And uh, yeah, so big orchestras. Uh, with the rise of the individual over society, we also have this rise of the 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 artist as God, the romantic anti-hero and tragic hero. And I mean, we see this perfectly encapsulated in Wagner and his gigantic ego. Um, but many are taking his cues from Wagner. In the the latter half of the romantic, we basically have Wagner and Brahms. So artist as God and artist as responsible citizen, I suppose. The cult of the genius is also rising. So this coincides with both composers taking on the artist as God role and virtuosos becoming more independent in, in their professions. Uh, I suppose that the, the greatest philosophical difference between classical and romantic composers could be boiled down to this question. The, the classical composer would say, here's, or the early romantic would say, here's my, my composition, what do you think of it? Whereas the romantic would say, here is my composition. What do you think of me? Uh, musical generalism is now on the wane. Whereas uh, Haydn and Mozart and their contemporaries would have played um, keyboard and violin and probably had some training in voice. Now we have people who are just violinists, just um, composer, pianists, just, you know, we're seeing greater specialization. Uh, we're seeing the rise of the conductor. Now, as I said earlier, modern conducting can largely be said to start with um, Mendelssohn and the Gewandhaus House around 1836. And by the time we're in the 1850s, 1860s, being a conductor was a thing. Conductors were generally pianists first. The old Central European system was that you would start as a repertoire in an opera house and work your way up to being a, a rehearsal pianist, a, a coach, an offstage conductor, a choral, uh, the, the offstage or chorus conductor, then an assistant conductor for the house, and then you would go off somewhere and get your own opera house and build your career from there. Um, but conductors were increasingly visible and increasingly um, celebrated. And we have Mendelssohn, and then Wagner, and then Richter, von Bülow, and Mahler, and then we're into the 20th century. So that's where that, that all began. Um, and now orchestras and, and musical societies are becoming civic institutions. They are bedrocks of the local um, communities. They are being funded by Friends of Music Societies and also by, uh, by the state. Um, so I just want to go back and, and point out four sort of turning points in music history um, in the Romantic era that really shook things up. 1836, as I've already mentioned, Gavant House and, uh, and Mendelssohn and Modern Conducting. In 1842, we have the establishment of both the Vienna and New York Philharmonics, um, two of the greatest orchestras in the world who are alive and well today. Um, in 1848, we have the, the Great Social Revolution, um, which was really the, the tipping point. I mean, there was no going back after that. It was the, um, the, moment, the moment where the individual really found his footing in Western society. And the industrial age was up and running. And then in 1865, music itself changes forever with... Tristan and Isolde, and tonality is um, completely freed. And from then on, uh, everything is so forward-looking, so full steam ahead. Um, one of the, the few aha moments 
that happened all at once. So now we are into the next era, the pre-war and interwar period of the 20th century. Uh, music is now an increasingly prestigious profession. It used to be that um, if you were wealthy and you had kids, you didn't want your kids to study music because that was, that was sort of uncouth. Um, now it's, it's becoming more couth to be a professional musician. We have fully professional established schools of music and orchestras. The conservatory system is now how musicians become musicians um, and launch careers. Uh, conductors and soloists are now fully independent professions. Recording uh, is, has um, been established, has, has, has been created, and is going to dominate much of the 20th century. And there's a fascination with authenticity, uh, with uh, a musicians' history and pedigree. And cosmopolitanism is now a status symbol, rather than a curiosity or an accident of experience. The ideals of the 20th century, well, having left it not too recently, we can safely say we, we know very well what they were, uh, power, industry, modernism, um, and in the arts, neo-antiquity, looking back and being extremely aware of our place in history. Um, we're self-aware, we're self-conscious, I think, in a way that earlier generations may not have been quite so much. And there's a major shift away from the old world, uh, largely due to World War I, of course. And we're seeing major social and political changes on a global scale. And there's increasingly no way to live in isolation, no way to live in a bubble, which is wonderful in a lot of ways. And well, <laughs> as we've seen lately, terrifying in others. Musically, um, there's increasing freedom from tonality the rise of atonalism, uh, atonality, the second Viennese school, um, which goes from, well, pretty music to music which might require a stiff drink now and then. Um, and we have new music which requires either huge orchestras like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring um, or hosts the planets or really, really scaled down chamber ensembles like Stravinsky's Vostro Dusseldat. Um, which can be seen as a result of World War I when so many young people died um, and there often just weren't that many musicians around. So they had to get creative. Um, we're seeing more and more national styles and this is not strictly nationalism, but it is a, a geographically based school of thought and sounds are really coalescing. So the Austro-Germanic sound is well established, but France and England are now back on the scene as major players, um, especially in the symphonic world. England produces Benjamin Britten and Sir Edward Elgar and Rayfron Williams, um, and be they become leaders in the symphonic world. And American music starts to acquire its own sound, its own footing, particularly by the 1920s and 30s. Um, in Russia, we see the end of the rimsky korsakov school and of, of what we would call, I guess, traditional Russian music. And we have the start of Soviet realism, which is going to pose some very interesting problems, um, starting in the, the 1930s and 40s for composers like uh, Shostakovich who now have to write for the state and what Stalin deems to be appropriate for everyday Soviet people. Shostakovich ends up finding some very clever and very brave ways around this, incidentally. Um, but each time he does so, he's taking his life in his own hands. So the pre-war and interwar period, we have composers like Elgar, von Williams, Prokofiev, Stravinsky, Ravel, Debussy, Nielsen, Sibelius, Charles Ives, Rachmaninoff, Bartok, Schoenberg, Webern, and Berg. Composers with highly individual styles, very different styles. Um, you have 
cosmopolitan composers like Stravinsky, who was Russian, but came to prominence in France and then be, uh, came to the United States and did quite a bit of, of work here. You have highly nationalistic composers like Elgar and Von Williams. Uh, you have the reluctant cosmopolitan in Prokofiev, who was forced abroad. Um, you have the quintessentially French music of Ravel and Debussy. Um, although Debussy dabbles in exoticism with uh, what he would call Eastern mood music, Eastern influence. And that, of course, raises a uh, question of cosmopolitanism versus appropriation, which is, again, a subject for another lecture another day. Um, so we're already running a bit long here, so I will, I will make these remarks brief. Um, the, the highly charged neo-romanticism or continued rom romanticism of Rachmaninoff and the strange but wonderful sound worlds of Ives and Bartok and Schoenberg. Uh, and we have the post-war years. And as many of you know, World War II, not so great for humanity. So after World War II, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a, a desire to move away from traditions and the status quo. Um, so we have extremes like the, the kawaii culture in Japan, where everything is meant to be as, as cute and light as possible to, to remove oneself from the horrors of war. And then we have the thorny, uber-intellectual, avant-garde music that dominates much of the new music heard in the West. Um, Soviet realism dominates through Stalin's life, really through the 1970s and 80s. Um, and in the United States, we have American composers writing Americana, very nostalgic, uh, Norman Rockwell-esque music in many ways. We see a return of neo-romanticism uh, neo in composers such as Barber and even Copland and Bernstein to some degree. Certainly composers like uh, Walter Piston and William Schumann. But avant-garde, the avant-garde by the 1950s and 60s is seen as the only acceptable way to write music, to write new music. So we have a whole area of the repertoire which is neo-romantic, which is tonal, which is wonderful. The Schumanns, the Pistons, the Persichettis, so on and so forth, which is just not listened to or performed all that much. And again, uh, it's a topic for another video, but we're well worth delving into. Um, by this point, professional orchestras are fully established. Um, they have huge budgets, fully professional, long you know, 52 week seasons, um, conductors are rock stars and demigods. Uh, recordings and videos dominate the market. They make lots and lots and lots of money for orchestras and um, big name soloists and conductors. They bring classical music to a wider audience. Um, orchestras are civic bedrocks, but they start to become museums in some cases, more than living, breathing, collaborative institutions. And uh, that's an issue that we've been dealing with in our field for the last 20 years or so. We're starting to swing back towards more collaboration, um, but it, it is a, a post-war issue that we've, that we've had to, uh, to battle, as is the question of modern music in general. Um, even as, as recently as, as Mahler in the, the early 1900s, Modern music dominated many programs. Now it's seen as a curiosity. It's often disdained or uh, audiences are fearful of it um, by and large. And we need to find a way to reconnect the community of an orchestra with music that's being written today. Uh, we also see, let me see, musicology so it's cleaning up Baroque and classical editions, both printed editions and performance practices. We see the rise of historically informed performance um, practices and, and the establishment of so-called period orchestras, which strive to recreate as faithfully as possible the exact conditions under which uh, music was performed in the Baroque and the classical and even early Romantic. Um, and by the, the 1980s and 90s in composition, 
pretty much anything goes. As, as one of my composition teachers like to say, uh, you can write a piece today for a performer to stand on his head and spit chickpeas under the stage and call it music. John Cage also said, you know, anything can be music. And he wrote 433, in which a performer simply sits on stage and for four, 30, four minutes and 33 seconds, whatever happens, an audience member coughing, somebody laughing, somebody dropping something, that's the piece, that's the music. Um, and to give some representative composers, Masayan Boulez, Britton, Cage, uh, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, Milton Babbitt, John Adams, uh, many, many more. But again, that's, that's a much longer discussion about modern music. Um, and in this era, there are, the rule is more, more often than not, um, professional composers who are non-performing. There are some composers who do perform, of course, but being a professional composer and just composing is, uh, very, very common. So that is an overview of music history and music appreciation. Um, so to draw a hopefully quick conclusion, so I realize I've been on for almost two hours and I, I thank you for your patience and for joining me. Um, you know, I, I hope this has been helpful, um, but I, I want to get to my conclusion then I'll give her a proper send off. Classical music has always, well, for the past few hundred years, stood as a witness to history and often helped shape history. The composers and musicians who bring their music to life have not been existing, writing, reacting in an ivory tower. They've been flesh, they're, they're flesh and blood human beings with personalities and lives and experiences and triumphs and tragedies. And all of that is in their music. And it's reflective of their life and times, the societies in which they lived, the languages they spoke, their hobbies, um, what they read, but also of their ideals. Schiller said that we must, as artists, we are not just citizens of a place, but also citizens of an age. And for better or worse, as composers, as performers, we are citizens of an age who have to record through our actions, through our creations, what is happening. And hopefully, it will serve as an inspiration to future generations and as a record, good or bad, hopefully sincere and honest of what we experienced. The context in music is everything. So when you listen to music, listen with a sense of history, with a sense of context, listen for the elements, the life and times and societies the social and religious conventions and convictions of, the, of these composers and the people in their circles. Think of their ideals, of their particular sense of romanticism, or lack thereof, if they did lack it, and their influences. Who were their heroes? What was most important to them? I guarantee you it's all in the music, and I hope that of the next few weeks or possibly months, we can come together through these videos and um, I can share some of these ideas and experiences with you. Um, I have about, I guess about 10 minutes. Um, I can stay on and take some questions if anyone wants to write a question in the comments section.